So I think we can start. And uh, first of all, a very welcome to all of you, to the ambassador of the EACR. My name is Alberto Bardelli. I'm the current EACR president. And I also welcome you to this first uh, Meet the Expert um, session uh, that uh, we have started. I assume uh, many of you are in lockdown, just like I am. I'm based in Italy and my lab has shut down nearly a month and a half ago, uh, but we have continued to work from home. And um, let me explain how today we work. Uh, you will hear a short talk from me, about 20 minutes, about my research and our latest results. And then uh, you'll get a chance to ask questions. Uh, this occurs through um, the web-based system. Uh, you can ask them and type your questions. Uh, we'll see them all at the end. And the questions can be about my talk, can be about uh, you know, your research, can be about your status. We're fully aware here at EACR of the challenging times. And we want to make sure uh, as ambassadors, you are aware that uh, you know, we're very close to all of you, very close to cancer research in Europe and worldwide. And we're working very hard to make sure that uh, we support you during these hard times. On the bright side, you know, you can see sun on my face uh, and um, Italy appears to be um, entering the phase two in a couple of weeks from now, which is exciting. And I think many other countries will do so if they have not done so yet. So, you know, despite the challenges, I think this was overall very interesting and positive time for many of us. And certainly for me, uh, I was able to think, reflect, without having to run my wheel all day. And I was able also to engage uh, my team, uh, which is a team of very large of 25 people, working from home. So this has been exciting and we have done a lot of uh, things we could not have done if we were in the lab. Nevertheless, of course, we look forward to go back to the lab. Okay, so let's start with uh, my talk. Um, hopefully you can see my slides. Um, and, uh, you know, today I will be talking to you about uh, two stories which are interlinked. One is inactivation of DNA repair, and uh, the second is high-dose vitamin C. Uh, both of them are linked by the fact that uh, they boost the immunotherapy. As we always do here at EACR, we present our disclosures. You can read them here. One of them is important. It's related to my association with Neofor. I will highlight it again when the time comes. My lab studies colon cancer, a disease that is very prevalent, that uh, many of you probably are very aware of. Um, but let me say a few things that will be important through the talk. First is it's a disease that we know from the histopathological and genetic state uh, very well. It starts from a single cell, it develops two series of, um, of steps. And in the end, unfortunately, when the disease um, spreads, which is the last step, it becomes very difficult to control. Well, my lab studies exactly this, how we can uh, intercept and potentially address with therapies uh, metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, there are various um, uh, ways to study colon cancer and uh, our approach is based on genetics. We study somatic mutations. And as you can see on the right hand side, they have uh, certainly a role in triggering the, the tumor development. They have a role in development of resistance. They are determinants of interpatient and intrapatient heterogeneity. These are downsides of the mutation, I guess. But interestingly enough, they can also be exploited, okay? So they tend to be present only in the plastic cells with some exception. Um, they can be actionable targets, I will discuss these, and they can certainly uh, lead to specific DNA repair defects that can be actionable um, depending on the type of mutations. Finally, a somatic mutation can be recognized as non-self, that is that they can be detected by the immune system once they turn into peptides, and this is a way, very important way in fact, to um, um, stop the spread of cancer. So let me start with um, uh, a few words on um, how somatic mutation in colon cancer can be actionable targets and can be affecting DNA repair uh, pathways and also are determinants of tumor heterogeneity. 
what is this heterogeneity? It means that every patient um, is a little different. We have known this for a long time. And you can see these applied to colon cancer. And over the years, we have realized that, uh, you know, depending on the type of mutation that um, uh, individual patients have, they will have different type of outcomes, uh, prognostically and clinically. You can also see here what has been the progress in the development of targeted therapies for uh, colon cancer. In fact, um, I would argue that some of the chemotherapeutic regimens that are the most widely used uh, one day will be considered as targeted agents because they hit specific DNA repair pathways. And then later I will discuss a little bit about some discoveries that we made in uh, targeting um, specific subset of colorectal cancer. Uh, but um, what I'm really fascinated and really excited about is the subset of colon cancer that have a specific DNA repair defect mechanism. This is the so-called mismatch repair deficiency. These are about 20%, 15 to 20% in stage one to three. However, they drop to three to 5% in stage four. Why is that? Because this is also a prognostic mark and having this type of instability uh, leads to a more uh, benign type of um, uh, colon cancer, which is interesting in itself especially because it is associated with very strong response to immunotherapies. You can see it here, right? So these plots, uh, the type of uh, tumor types that, that you have and plots the, the response to, to, to immunotherapies. As you can see here, the best responders, at least in colorectal tumors, are those, are those that have mismatch repair deficiency. And this actually applies broadly. So we now know that this um, inactivation of DNA repair leads to uh, uh, a better response to immunotherapy. So why that is, and what can we can learn from, from this phenotype? And this is what my lab has been studying for a number of years now. You can see Giovanni Germano, Monica Laba, two, two members of my teams. Um, they have uh, studied this over the years very carefully, and they decided to learn more about the role of mismatch repair by inactivation of the corresponding genes in can, in colorectal cancer cells. These are the genes that are involved um, in this pathway. You possibly know them, but let's summarize. This is a pathway that is designed to recognize um, single nucleotide variants, uh, uh, changes in the uh, sequence of the DNA, and uh, whenever there is replication and there is a mistake, they are there to correct this. Unfortunately, during uh, the development of, of colon tumors and other tumor types, they sometimes uh, get inactivated through various mechanisms. And one gene that we were very interested in is MLH1, because it's the most prevalently inactivated mismatch repair genes in colon cancer. It's, it's pre predominantly inactivated by either mutations or epigenetic silencing. So Giovanni and Monica decided to knock out MLH1, this, this gene that I mentioned, in a couple of cell lines. The first is a colon cell lines. You can see here that we have uh, use CRISPR-Cas to delete the genes. And we, this led to, as expected, but was important to show it, to mismatch repair deficiency and microsatellite instability. Importantly, when we injected the, the cells that we had uh, modified into um, immunocompromised animals, they grew um, just like the cells from which they derived. However, when we injected these cells into immunocompetent animals, as you can see here, the cells did not grow properly. And over time, we realized this was a very strong phenotype and the mice never developed the tumor. We then did the same experiment into a very aggressive tumor, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. We deleted MLH1. We led to, this led to mismatch repair deficiency. As you can see here, uh, the cells that were mismatch repair deficient despite arriving from the parental cells and having no Cas9 expression because we use a transient Cas9, did not grow properly and um, were much less tumorigenic in animals. So the next question we ask is, what are the functional basis of this phenotype? Why is that? What can we learn? How does this turn and applies to patients? Well, one way to do this was to understand uh, the molecular basis and the functional basis of the phenomenon. And let's start for the functional basis. You can see here that if we suppress CD8, so we fuse antibodies that will stop the function of CD8 in, in animals, the, 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 the cells that are normally unable to grow will grow back, suggesting that this is a CD8 dependent phenotype, very strong phenotype. Because these cells don't grow very well in immunocompetent animals, we initially injected them in immunodeficient animals uh, in which they grow, and then we transplanted them into an immunocompetent host. The reason for doing that, in this way, they form a larger tumors, and we can study immunotherapy. You can see in this case that uh, uh, the cells are unable to control um, the tumor, the, the, the host is unable to control the tumor growth, although it delays it profoundly. But most importantly, in this setting, we can study immunotherapy. And you can see if we 
put the cells into an immunodeficient animal, transplant the tumor then into an immunocompetent animal, and then see what happens with immunotherapy. It was a, it was a beautiful response and, and almost a complete response, which for us was very remarkable. So these cells are rejected. Perhaps this is telling us about uh, the, the corresponding phenotype in patients. And so what can we learn from this process? And um, is there anything specific involved in this process? Well, it is, there is in fact, and you can read because this has been published, but what we found excitingly is that once you turn off mismatch repair, these cells continuously change and express new new antigens. If they do so, then they become more recognizable by the immune system. And so we came up with a model that suggests that uh, you know, the more time you wait after the inactivation of DNA repair, the more this mechanism becomes very evident. And so the more you, you time passes, the more you get new antigen expression. Importantly, you can also faster the process, uh, make the process faster by uh, generating a bottleneck, so inactivating this, this, this pathway, uh, but then cloning the cells so that they become clonal. At this point, you know, it takes very little time for the cells to be recognized by the immune system. The next question, which is very exciting, is can we use this therapeutical? Can, can this crazy idea be, be turned into something useful for the patient? So in other words, can we block a tumor suppressor gene because so the fact of uh, MLH1 and the other mismatch repair genes are involved in, uh, uh, in tumor suppression. And so, you know, this is a genetically validated pathway. And we thought for the first time that it would be a good idea to generate MLH an MLH1 inhibitor and other inhibitors of the pathway. So we decided that as crazy as it may seem, perhaps we could help patients by turning their tumors into mismatch repair deficient. In order to do that, and here's where I have my conflict, which I declare again, we created a company uh, that is designed and is based in Cambridge, UK, that is designed to uh, develop idea. Um, um, we are in stage one of the process, but um, very excitingly, we, we, we did get some, some results already, and, and we found how we can inactivate these genes with small molecules. And we have several series of these molecules which we are testing as soon as we go back to the lab. In fact, one exciting experiment we want to do is, if I give these molecules, can I make my tumor uh, that is normally very aggressive turn into a uh, less aggressive tumor and perhaps responsive to more therapy? So I told you a little bit about DNA repair mechanism and how this mutation can be recognized by the immune system. Let me tell you something more about how this mutation could become uh, uh, even more prominent and how we can uh, boost uh, immunotherapy. And this is a very crazy experiment that uh, a project that was done in my group by Giovanni uh, Germano and uh, Alessandro Magri. And uh, you know, the idea came from uh, old data about vitamin C and, and the role in immunity. You all know about vitamin C, perhaps you're taking even pills um, to, um, uh, to, uh, to boost uh, your, uh, your, your body. But uh, you know, let me uh, revi uh, remind you what, what this is. This is a, a vitamin, it means it's essential. We uh, cannot generate itself. Uh, we need to acquire it from an uh, external source. Uh, we also know that uh, lymphocytes and in general uh, white blood cells will accumulate high concentration of vitamin C and, and several other aspects, including the fact that if we don't have vitamin C uh, permanently or for a long period, we, we get uh, to a disease that has been studied very, very carefully. And, uh, and so we know that vitamin C is crucial for several of our functions, including the immune function. It's not the first time that vitamin C has been studied and, and there was this very, very elegant paper by Luke Antley and colleagues a number of years ago that suggested that vitamin C was targeting specifically um, the, the RAS pathway. And because we study RAS and RAF in colorectal cancer, we thought maybe a good idea to see uh, what happens when we give this vitamin to our cells. But let's review first uh, the data, the clinical data about the use of vitamin C in the clinic. And this comes back to the days of Linus Pauling and his colleagues that initially proposed vitamin C as a treatment for cancer. You know, as you know, Linus Pauling won a Nobel Prize for chemistry and then went on to, want to win a second Nobel Prize uh, for literature, uh, for peace, sorry. Uh, so he, he, he is a double uh, w uh, winner of the Nobel Prize. And, and, but not many people know, or perhaps remember that one of the approaches he proposed is to use vitamin C as a therapy for cancer. And he, he published this very beautiful paper suggesting that by giving vitamin C to patients, you will get a benefit. And so these papers were sort of forgotten because he 
in years. These are the initial data by Linus Pauling and, and Cameron, and then uh, subsequent data by the Mayo Clinic and others have questioned that. But one important fundamental difference exists here, which I, I would really like to highlight. So that Pauling and, and, and his colleagues were giving vitamin C um, as an intravenous injection. The others, for the most part, have used vitamin C orally. What's the difference? There is a huge difference. If you take pills, if you take hundreds of oranges, that's not enough. It will not in, be enough to increase your immune response, uh, at least to tumors. That's what we think. Instead, you really need to achieve very high level of, of plasma concentration of vitamin C, and this can only be done by parental dosing of the vitamin. This is what uh, the National Cancer Institute says. I mean, there are already several therapies that have been proposed, but nothing that has been proven fundamentally um, and definitive. But the experiment that really led my group to start studying vitamin C is the following. We were, fo we were tracking tumors, some of which I already described, for example, like colon cancer, in either immunocompromised or immunocompetent animal. You can see here the effect of vitamin C was specifically uh, linked to the presence of an immune system. So we became very excited, not in all tumors, but in many tumor types. And you can see this uh, very beautifully here. And depending on the dose of vitamin C, we could get tumor regression, as you can see in this slide. So we became more excited and, and, and decided to study this in more details. And one thing that we found is that uh, the, the um, uh, dosing vitamin C will increase the expression of interferon gamma and uh, 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 in, in, in CD4 and CD8 T lymphocytes, suggesting that perhaps it was affecting the immune system. And then, um, if you suppress the activity of these T lymphocytes, some of the properties of vitamin C, including its ability to stop the growth of tumor, in part was mediated by the immune system rather than being uh, addressed uh, directly to the cells, to the tumor cells. And perhaps even more exciting, we saw that there was a very strong co uh, combinatorial effect by combining vitamin C together with immunotherapy, as you can see here. Even more striking, this was uh, what we observed when we gave combinatorial therapy. So, you know, multiple uh, dosage of uh, vitamin C together with anti-CTL4 and anti-PD1, suggesting that combining vitamin C with the current uh, regimens would be really effective. What does vitamin C uh, do to these tumors? Well, we, well, I tell you what we know. There is still something that we don't know, of course. It will increase inf lymphocyte infiltration, as you can see here. And in general, uh, we think it will massively boost uh, the, the response of the immune system to uh, recognition of new neuroantigens. So if that's the case, we thought perhaps we should try this vitamin C treatment in the models that I previously described, so in the models that have mismatch repair deficiency. And that's why we observe these very striking results, right? When we use vitamin C in immunodeficient animals, again, nothing was observed independently of the mismatch repair status of the doses of vitamin C. However, in immunocompetent animals, you can see there was a profound delay in growth of the tumor. Even more striking, and which led to a very recent publication by my group, was the effect that was observed by giving vitamin C. Sorry, this means I've been speaking for about 20 minutes, which is perfect. And um, so, by, uh, by combining vitamin C with immunotherapy in these mature repair deficient tumors, we would get very, very profound responses. So right now, my lab is very excited because what we want to do is to generate a clinical trial that recapitulate this finding and see whether we can help uh, our cancer patients by uh, dosing vitamin C and uh, immunotherapy in either mismatch repair proficient or deficient tumors. And in, in conclusion, I, I would like to summarize uh, a few things that I've said. I, I mentioned uh, that we study colon cancer, the type of DNA repair defects that are associated with colon cancer, the fascinating feature of this vegetative repair deficient colon cancer, and the fact that uh, you know, by combining uh, inactivation of DNA repair, specifically mismatch repair, together with superactivation of the immune system, as we think we are doing with vitamin C, we have seen very profound effect in, in regression uh, of these tumors, and that suggests that maybe this could lead to uh, effective therapies. And in concluding, I'd like to thank all my group that you can see here, um, a few people that I already mentioned. Alessandro Magri was the leading author of the uh, Science Translational Medicine paper on vitamin C. Uh, instead, Giovanni Germano was the author of the Nature paper on inactivation of DNA repair. Giovanni Crisafulli and all the others uh, bioinformaticians that uh, were 
really critical in my experiments. And of course, many other people were involved in, in these studies, which I don't have time to, to mention here, uh, but they are listed here. Uh, Monica did the knockout of, uh, of the linear repair genes, and, and you can see here all our colleagues uh, we collaborate with, including some clinical um, um, fellow that uh, we designed the, cli the clinical trials with. And with that, I've finished my talk. I promise I would stay in 20 minutes, which I did. And I believe I will now turn it, um, the mic to Claire uh, from uh, the EACR office um, that uh, we will moderate the discussion. Hi, thank you, Alberto, for that overview of your research. Really interesting. Um, so the next section of this webinar is going to be questions as well as a bit of a discussion, um, depending on what questions you ask, maybe about researching during this time of COVID-19 as well. So we've got a couple of questions that have just come in. Alberto, if you want to um, take a look at those in relation to the talk you've just given, and I now invite if anyone would like to submit their questions, both on that talk and on this discussion of researching in the current climate, um, please use the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. And also Alberto would like to give people the opportunity to ask questions verbally. So if this is something that would interest you, if you have a microphone, um, you can use this button on your screen to raise your hand and we'll be able to see who's raised their hands and we'll invite you to uh, speak verbally. So um, I'll hand to you, Alberto, for those first couple of questions. Yes, of course, I'd be happy to, Claire. And let me clarify these. So, I am now at your disposal, right? So what would be really nice to do in the next, uh, I don't know, time that we have um, is that you are very free to ask me questions um, on my science, but also I would really like to hear about your experience as cancer researcher in the time of COVID. What is your status? What do you think EACR can help you with? Uh, as you've seen in our web, uh, uh, base uh, template and in our emails we have been trying to reach out to you guys uh, we know that it's a challenging time but as I also alluded to we try to be positive so I will now call um, uh, the, 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 the ambassadors that are listed here and please state your name and your institution and if you don't mind read out your um, your question so the first question comes from Yuka um, if you if you have a microphone, uh, turn it on and uh, go ahead with your question and um, uh, tell us something about you and your experience. So this probably suggests that uh, maybe uh, you don't have a mic uh, or you cannot uh, speak uh, through the uh, your computer, so I will I'm, read I'm, out. I'm trying to. Oh, yeah. Can you, you hear me? Now? Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Hi. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I, I just like first of all like the the format. It's it's just uh, on, on these times when you cannot travel, so it's it's good to be in touch even even through this. So yeah, I think this is a great idea. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that vitamin C is, is, is really striking, uh, striking data and, 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 and striking idea. And, and I really always generally enjoy when, when old ideas are followed up. So, so uh, but my specific question was that is this, you just happen to have this MMS deficient cells and you tried them with vitamin C. Is there any reason why it would or would not uh, 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 basically synergize with other DNA repair defect cells? Have you have you tested? No, it's it's a great question. And so um, at this time, we have uh, tested it in mismatch repair proficient, and you have seen the data are interesting, but not as dramatic as in mismatch repair deficient. But you're raising a very good point. So does this apply to other DNA repair defects, for example? HR defects or you know brackenness or, or other types of uh, DNA repair alteration. We don't know yet and we are uh, testing some of these um, absolutely right now. And so yeah this is a good point um, and thank you for your question. Um, yeah. Do you mind if I ask you to describe your situation where you're based and whether you're home, you're able to work, uh, what's, what's the status of, um, of your country? I don't know where you're based. So I'm based in Finland. Uh, Turku, Turku, Finland. So Finland is doing relatively good. So we never had the real peak uh, of COVID, but we are stranded. So we are allowed to work at in the lab on the low pace. So I've had like half of my people coming in once in a while. 
so we've been able to even keep up some of the experiments. So I think Finland is really doing well in that sense. But but me, my personally, I've been stranded at home, cooking food for my kids, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> taking taking care of their their schoolwork uh, uh, for the past four four weeks, and and it's getting a little bit mentally challenging. I can tell that we really start needing some some uh, stimuli. But but thanks for asking. It's I think we are we are doing very well. Okay, so that, that, that is very useful information. We are aware that there are some countries but, uh, you know, we're less affected. Of course, I'm based in Italy, which was very, very badly affected. Although, you know, there are rumors that we may be opening up after May 50, if the numbers still look good. But, you know, the same applies to us. So I can tell you, I, I've, I've, I've been making bread starting from East uh, uh, for the past uh, three weeks or four weeks. My family enjoys that. <laughs> uh, I've learned how to gather a new culture of yeast uh, from uh, the skin of, uh, of vegetables. So if you're interested, there is a protocol on <laughs> uh, if you want um, uh, to make your own bread. But in general, it's good to hear from everybody. And, and we're glad that you know, you're able to um, continue your work. Yeah. Fantastic. So I'll, um, I'll move on. I see that there are many questions now. Um, and so another question, uh, I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm very bad at pronouncing your name, I'm sure. Are you Lotti? Uh, do you mind if you have a mic? Can you can you speak up? So maybe oh oh you can I can even see you hi. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll read the question loud and then I'll address it. Uh, excellent and crisp presentation. How do you target cancer cells when you use anti-MLH1 um, uh, molecules? So this is the next level. Uh, we just developed uh, some of these molecules and we hope um, to test them soon. These are um, small molecules that will bind to the uh, active site of MLH1. We had to make a crystal of MLH1 and, and find the best uh, fitting molecules. It took uh, a couple of years, but we now have them. Uh, of course, there will be side effects, we, we think, but uh, we'll, we'll see how they look like. Um, and until we test them, we don't know. But fascinating because it's something that has never been tried. It's certainly a first-in-class attempt. Great. And I apologize if I didn't, uh, if I didn't uh, let you speak, but I thought you might not have uh, um, a mic. So I have a question now from Grandezza Aburido. Uh, Grandezza, if you can speak, uh, please go ahead and... Uh, um, um, uh, read your question and we can talk. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. That was a really good talk. Thank you. Um, our lab is also on colorectal cancer, so that was a really interesting perspective. Um, so my question is um, just about staying productive at home because that is my biggest problem at the moment is just I'm finding so much other stuff to be doing instead of my actual work and I can't focus. Do you have any tips or advice? So I can tell you what happened to me. So I have, um, I have a lab of 25, right, as I said. And so I, all of a sudden for me, my, my job has changed from... Um, you know, of traveling all over the world, which is what I used to do for several reasons, like many of us used to do, um, uh, to spending uh, virtually all my time at home. But one thing that I found is key is to remain connected, right? So I talk to my lab members virtually every day. So we have, uh, we had lab meeting tomorrow, well, uh, today, we'll have uh, um, what we call the bioinformatic group uh, meeting tomorrow. Um, um, we had uh, started an international uh, seminar series in which several uh, other European um, scientists and American scientists uh, have spoken to. Um, how do you remain focused? I think the way I did it, I, I, I can tell you the first few, few couple of weeks were the worst. I was sort of shocked, but then you realize there are a lot of things you can do. So you, you write down your targets, right? In our case was to clean up all the bioinformatic analysis. So we had a lot, lot of uh, combinational data to look at. We luckily had access to our servers. And so all the labs started to focus on a specific project. So all the preclinical models that we have, the genomic and the transcriptomic, we put all the information together. We started to work on that. And then one thing that we do every uh, month is the so-called confessional. So I spend one hour uh, 
sorry, ha uh, half an hour um, uh, in three afternoons with everybody in my, in my team. And they, this is a one-to-one -one chance that they can talk. And so they, they can talk about depression. <laughs> they can talk uh, about uh, you know, difficulties. And I found this very useful. And one of the people that is here, Vito, uh, became positive at some point. So he was taken to the hospital, was very sick, and then he's home now. And so, you know, there was also a part of supporting the others. So there was difficulty. Some people uh, are from America or from other countries. They were stranded here in Torino um, uh, without a lot of uh, knowledge on the, on the language, so we helped them. Um, but I would say the key is connectivity. And the second one is think to having more time to think. I don't know, for me, it was great. So we had new ideas that we could not have before. So I, my life will change, but I hope for the best. Okay, thank you. I, I hope I address uh, your question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so the next question from, comes from Alexei uh, Tikhonov. Um, if you have a phone, a microphone, um, Alexei, please go ahead. Um, hello? Yes, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, I want to say thanks for your presentation and I would like to ask about the publishing process because I'm from Russia and when quarantine situation, we all stay home. So I think it's the same situation as in Italy. And my supervisor advised me to write as much as I can to I consider all uh, my results since I stayed at home. So um, in your case, what do you think about the productivity um, of the future articles or planning some future like uh, lectures, staying at home? Uh, will you spend much more time on that or not? Yeah, I see your point. So I cannot tell you because of course I don't know what will happen to productivity. I can tell you that we use the time, like you said, to write um, up articles that were, you know, in the drawer or almost finished. Um, I can tell you that, you know, we even submitted the papers. Um, in fact, they came back and we told the editors that our lab was shut down. So there is a new AR and they understand the difficulties we have and they understand how we can possibly, you know, try to um, uh, address them. So uh, ultimately, cancer research needs experiments. Uh, and most of them are wet experiments. So I think these will reduce uh, productivity in, uh, in some way. Uh, but that doesn't mean that when you're home, you should feel uh, uh, depressed or you know, uh, uh, other things. I think you should focus, like, like you said. And uh, you know, I, I also challenge all my people to study R or any other programming tools. I think all of us will, will face bioinformatics one way or another. And so we'll need to, um, to become proficient with that. And so there are free, um, a webinar on the use of uh, bioinformatic tools, which is what I advise my people to, to do. I hope I address your question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Alexei. You're in Russia where, if you don't mind to say? Uh, I'm from Moscow, it's the capital. Yes, of course, Moscow. Okay. Do <laughs> svidania, then. <laughs> uh, next question is from Elisabetta Rovida that uh, might very well be uh, a fellow countryman, but she may be based somewhere else. So, Elisabetta, if you have a, a mic um, and you can use it, uh, feel free to ask the question. Hi, can you listen to me? Yes. Hi, thanks. Thank, thanks a lot for your talk and uh, uh, also to ACR for this uh, opportunity. I think it's very, very useful and I really appreciate that. So my question, I mean, is in general, if you are somehow uh, organizing the second phase to come back to the lab, if you have, I mean, uh, some advices or some uh, sure. um, directions from your institution about the... Um, Where are you based, Elisabeth? Whatever. <laughs> yes, of course. At the University of Florence, we are still a little bit waiting, let's say. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we are also waiting here. What I can tell you is we started to consider plans. Um, I know, for example, that there are several institutions in Milan have already very detailed plans on phase two. That for those that don't know, in Italy appears to be starting on May 4th. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you, you know, it will look like a shift. So, you know, perhaps there will be shifts in the lab. 
uh, you, you of course have to respect social distance. Uh, it will be a different world, but uh, you know, we are all eager to go back and uh, start uh, again the fight against cancer. And so you know, we have um, um, sort of started to realize what's the physical space that everybody occupies in the lab, which are the most important people. So I can tell you I'm not important, so I can stay home. And so I will let the experimental people to go in first. Uh, bioinformatics experts will stay home longer in uh, uh, administrative also, but people looking after mice, cells, will be the one that go back in. And like I said, most likely in shifts, but we don't know yet. Yep. Thank you, Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth for, for your question. Thank you, bye. Okay, bye bye. Ciao. Okay, so I assume the next uh, question doesn't come from Huawei P20 Lite. I hope you have a, um, a name. <laughs> and uh, please so go ahead and identify yourself. And if you could tell us, uh, I'll, I'll address your question. It's a very specific scientific question. But if you don't mind telling us a little bit of your situation, uh, please. Your mic is uh, off, so you may want to turn your mic on. I can see that. Or, or maybe you cannot, uh, you cannot use your mic. So I'll, I'll read the question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, uh, well, uh, my name is Nadia. I'm from Serbia, from Institute of uh, Oncology and Radiology. Uh, we are now still working in shift. So it's uh, very stressful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, shifts are just. Um, uh, I currently have uh, some papers to write uh, and my thesis, so I can stay home, but uh, I'm obligated to to come to work. I so, see. And you uh, would not like, this is interesting, you would prefer to stay home. Yes, uh, because I would feel uh, much more, uh, let's say, safer, because the uh, Institute is uh, treating patients and uh, we have, uh, uh, I think, about 60 uh, personnel, doctors and, and uh, nurses that are infected. So, uh, like I said, it's very stressful. I totally understand. So we say we are in a similar situation whereby it's a comprehensive cancer center here. So there are also patients and, uh, uh, and yes, if you don't respect uh, the rules properly, there, there are risks. At the other end, I can also tell you that it is equally stressful to be forced home uh, for a long time. And I can feel this from uh, the people of my group. So I totally see bo both sides. I'll go quickly. Uh, to your question, which is very relevant. Should immunotherapy switch of mismatch repair deficiency only in tumors or in whole organs? And of course, what is the effect on normal cells and new tumor occurrence? And it's uh, absolutely a very good question and one of the main concerns that we have. So will this impact also normal cells? Well, one way to address this is to look at a clinical syndrome called constitutional mismatch repair deficiency. So this is a syndrome in which from the zygote state, you will have an activation of both copies of mismatch repair. So it's a lynch uh, homozygous. Um, and so these, these individuals surprisingly are alive. They develop tumors, sometimes they resolve the tumors by themselves, uh, but they are certainly uh, alive and, 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 breathe until, and reach uh, uh, adulthood. And so we think that there may be compensatory mechanism for mismatch repair in normal cells. And we will see if there would be um, uh, alterations to normal cells and, and what this could be. But you're right, there could be side effects. And of course, when you attempt a new, a new road, it's always difficult. But thank you for asking that important question and best of luck with your situation in Serbia. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, so I, I think I just want to advise everybody that uh, uh, for, for technical reasons today, we. I was actually not expecting these many questions, but it's fantastic. <laughs> um, we'll have another about five, uh, five minutes to go before we have to move to the next, because many signed up, and so there will be a follow-up uh, 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 media expert. But uh, I'll, I'll try to address as many questions as possible, as fast as possible. So, uh, Cedric, um, uh, Cedric, if you want, uh, if you are able to speak, uh, go ahead and identify yourself and tell us a little bit uh, what your situation is. Hello, you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Uh, 
So first of all, thank you for this presentation. Uh, I'm Cédric, I'm a research fellow in uh, the Cancer Research Center of Lyon in France. We are all locked down too. And uh, is it okay? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. So you're at home uh, as well. Uh, well so we are, we, are, we are doing a home working and uh, basically we are supposed to go back to work uh, step by step by May 11th. But uh, we'll see yeah. how the disease will progress in France. Um, I have this question, yes. Uh, do you think that what you see with the, the vitamin C is associated to a systemic activation of the immune system or is it uh, differentially activated in the, within the tumor? Yes, very good point. And uh, the, yeah, in the, the, by extension, um, has most of the, the, the nutrients or uh, differentially, let's say, concentrated within the tumor? Do you think that the, uh, the, the, it's the same for the vitamin C and uh, that, right. the, that you could see could be specific to certain region within the tumor? So uh, we think that vitamin C has two effects. One, that in our case was not particularly evident, was, which was tumor cell specific, right? Cell autonomous, in other words. And that would apply to the second part of your question, how does the nutritional status of cells uh, impact. But if we get the main effect of vitamin C, um, if you go to the paper, I didn't have time to show you that, but I can tell you because it addresses one of your questions is if we take vitamin C and we give it to a mouse that uh, has no tumor, and then we take CD4 and CD8 cells and we transfer them, adaptive transfer, right, to another mouse that bears the tumors, they will be very active. So we think that in general, it will activate system systemically the immune system of, of the mouse. That, that, that is what we know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I realize I cannot fully address the, the question and whether cell um, heterogeneous, right? Um, yeah, the fact that we cure some mice with uh, vitamin C plus immunotherapy suggests that even if heterogeneity plays a role, it should not be a major role because we can apparently counteract that. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Cedrica. I apologize. I, I will go a little faster now. Um, but sorry about that, but uh, very good to hear from you and best of luck in, uh, in Lyon. Thank Patricia. you. Thank you, bye. Bye bye. Patricia, um, if you can speak, uh, turn your mic on and um, let us know a little bit about your situation. Yeah, I can see that you can. Hi, hello. Yeah, right. Yes, go ahead. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for organizing these. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Sorry, uh, yeah, it's, that was a great presentation. So my, uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm from Portugal originally, uh, but at the moment I'm a postdoc at MSK uh, in New York. So the situation here is also really bad. Um, uh, there is an idea of uh, starting um, the lab back um, middle of May, but uh, we don't have too much information right now. So that's the situation. My question uh, for you was, uh, how do you see this um, coronavirus situation affecting, uh, the, um, affecting hiring, hiring in the academic setting? Yes, very good point. So first of all, uh, very nice to hear from you. I have uh, one of my trainees is now becoming a group leader at MSK. She's uh, still mm -hmm. in Neil Rosenfeld. Her name is Sandra Mizales. So I know your status yeah. very well. Um, <laughs> And I hope you really can go back to work. In fact, the paper that I mentioned earlier that we cannot uh, go back uh, we, with experiments for is, is a joint paper with her. Um, respectively to very important questions. So what, what impact will this have on hiring and in general cancer research? It will have an impact, no questions, because some of the resources will be less. Uh, some of the resources will be dislocated differently. And so, yes, unfortunately, I think uh, it, it cannot have a positive impact, I cannot imagine, on the funding situation, which then turns into the hiring. On the bright side, which uh, I think is neglected right now, these uh, emergencies has brought science back to center stage, right? Evidence-based medicine, science. You can hear politicians, and I don't want to make any names, uh, everywhere that never listen to anybody that apparently are listening to scientists. Now, scientists sometimes say stupid things, 
but uh, most of the time these days are apparently helping out. So I think this would be very, very positive impact for science and for research because, you know, you can clearly see that a lot of people that were against, you know, clinical science, etc., are coming back and say, you know what, uh, without that, we would be really in a worse situation. So on some side, bad, 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 bad for the future. On other sides, very positive for the future. Best of luck, Patricia. And Thank you. Good to, good to hear from you. Uh, Claire, I'm asking you how much longer I can go because if if I don't shoot at the, at the attendees, they will keep asking questions. So let me know what I want. To yeah, but do you want to do <laughs> one more question and then we'll have to wrap it up for today? Uh, you know, we didn't know how it would go. Uh, there will be more. And so for those that unfortunately didn't have could not get your uh, questions answered. Um, we'll do this in the future and you can sign up for, for future. Carolina uh, Reduzzi, um, um, there you go. It's your turn. And so you can, you can ask your question. Your mic is off right now, Carolina. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk, Professor Bardelli. I, I work in Milano and uh, uh, Yes, what, what, what I was asking is regarding what you ask us, so what the ASCR could do for researchers right now in this pandemic situation. And I was thinking that uh, since now we are like switching to um, online uh, version of connections and communications, and maybe we should like, exploit it as much as possible right now to create new connections around researchers in Europe. And I also was thinking that, for example, last week I had to do a data session and I could not do it in my institute. But maybe uh, the AACR could create some opportunity to do sort of data sessions among uh, young researchers for, from all, uh, all over Europe. Of course, not presenting unpublished data, which would be a problem, but for recently published data which could be an opportunity to both have uh, uh, um, suggestions, but also to find new collaborators. Maybe it could be by topic. For example, I work on liquid biopsy. Yes. That is something feasible. I like the idea very much. I think uh, this could be, have some traction. Let me tell you that, for example, in June, we were supposed to have the meeting, um, the annual EACR meeting here in Torino. The meeting has transitioned to virtual and they, is two days and the second day you will see it's all dedicated to posters uh, selected for oral presentation. So that um, is a way of addressing your question. But what I really like about your idea is that perhaps EACR could help by creating opportunities for young researchers to present their data. And so I'll return the question to you as an ambassador and all the others that are here. Would you be willing to help in these efforts? So in other words, if we give you a platform that you can use, would you then be willing to engage and invite your colleagues and organize yeah. that? Me personally, absolutely, yes, of course. Of course, okay. So, so I think, uh, you know, Claire, I think we, we have a very good suggestion as well at the end uh, for, for future opportunities that uh, we can exploit um, with the office and, um, and, um, and the ACR in general. Yes, all thank right. you, Caroline. Just to follow up on your point, Carolina, and to all the ambassadors present, um, the EACR are, very new to all of this. This is our first webinar, so thank you so much for taking part. And we are trying to expand the work that we do in this format. Um, so a lot, of, most of you will have been invited to next week's sessions with um, Caroline Dive as well. And we will have future uh, meet the expert sessions like this with our board, as well as trying to expand to more of those conferences that people aren't able to travel to, having virtual versions of those conferences available to our members for free this year, we're gonna have virtual conferences on DNA damage responses, um, cancer metabolism, and imaging cancer. So those resources will be freely available to our members. And in terms of collaborations, we recently um, created this Find a Collaborator tool, which you can find on the EACR website. So if you are searching for a collaboration, check there, or if you would like to find a collaboration, um, you can get in touch with us and we can help you try and find a collaboration as well, which is just even more important in these times. So um, we will wrap it up there because we have this other session to start. So thank you all very much for joining and thank you very much to Alberto for hosting this session.
Um, I will be in touch with you in the next few days. I'll send a little email with a survey because we'd really appreciate your feedback on how useful you found this session and how easy it was to interact with the software as well because we've not been using it very long. So how easy it was for the, the Q&A, whether you liked having the microphone on, things like that. So we'd really appreciate your feedback and we hope to see you again at another virtual session very soon and as soon as possible back at our physical conferences. So, unless you have anything else to say, Alberto? No, I, I also want to echo what you said, and I want to, you know, apologize again to uh, Samuel, uh, Bramut, and the others that I could not address their question today, but uh, that was um, uh, uh, the initial attempt. Uh, we are perfecting this from the look of it, since there is a lot of interest, so uh, this looks great. And also, best of luck to all of you, and, uh, you know, keep doing, keep focusing, and you know, cancer will be backstage, um, uh, center stage soon. Okay. All right. Bye. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye.